Poetry Pals, welcome back to another video. My name's Josie Alford, I read silly articles on the internet so you don't have to. And this week, poetry is dead. Again. In fact, according to this guy, it's been dead for 100 years. Yeah, that's right, we've got another one. Another article written about poetry being dead. And it is only a matter of time until we get another one calling poetry the new rock and roll. In this video, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the writer who wrote this article. I'm going to summarise the article and I'm going to tell you why he's wrong. And I'm even going to give you some recommended reading to reaffirm your faith in the life of poetry. This is for you, Matthew. If you are watching this, then please please, if you're not going to watch the whole article to hear my opinions, just skip to the end and read my recommended reading because I genuinely think that they are good poems that you would enjoy. So have a think about it. But before we go any further, please make sure you like my video, subscribe and turn on notifications. The engagement really helps small creators like me get found. And while we're on the subject, why don't you follow me on social media? I am at Josie Alford Poet on all the things. And you can support the channel by joining me on Patreon or buying me a coffee. Or by pre-ordering my debut poetry collection and buying a ticket to my book launch party. And the links to do all of those things are in the description down below. I mean, if you want to do that, because poetry is dead, so nothing matters. Okay, so about the writer. So before I started reading the article, I thought I would do some cursory research on Matthew Walther. I think it's useful to know where someone is coming from when they are making such accusations about the life of poetry. So here's what I found out. He is the editor of Lamp Magazine, which is a bi-monthly magazine featuring reporting, commentary and coverage of arts and letters from an orthodox Catholic perspective. So he's Catholic. Interestingly, the latest edition of his magazine features an article in appreciation of Philip Larkin, a poet who was born the year The Wasteland came out. Put a pin in that, I will come back to it later. I reckon he must be around my age or older, probably around his mid thirties, as in the article he describes himself as a millennial and talks about reciting works of T.S. Eliot on the bus to school in the mid noughties after reading anti-war bloggers and watching the Apocalypse Now Redux, which came out in 2001. So it's anywhere between, he was in school, anywhere between the early and mid noughties. So like, that's in his 30s. He has written a number of op-eds for the New York Times, including Why America Needs Catholicism. It's an article about how Catholic, che Catholic teachings straddle party lines in America. From this and other articles, we can assume that he is neither left nor right. I grasped that he is economically liberal, but socially very conservative. In short, he is anti-racist, anti-war, not a fan of the rich or expectation of the poor, exploitation of the poor, but also anti-abortion and anti-equal marriage, and against the increasingly nebulous claims of academic progressives and activists about the nature of the human person. Now, I can't say for sure, but I think he's referring to trans and non-binary rights. I think. One final note about him is that he also wrote an article entitled Baseball is Dying, the Government Should Take It Over. Now, I tried to read this article too, but something about sports makes my eyes glaze over and I just, I zone out. In it, he makes the point that baseball has a lower viewership and attendance and that it will one day be consigned to irrelevance and history. To save it, it should be nationalised or something along those lines. The reason I bring this article up is that it makes one of two articles in 2022 in which he, maybe lazily, describes something as dying. Arguably, this is to get the link clicks onto articles where he arguably makes kind of poor arguments which don't really matter because he's already made you mad or interested enough to click. 
So with that in mind, let's talk about this bloody article, shall we? So I read the article a couple of times. I even subscribed to the New York Times so I could return to the article and read Matthew's other articles. This is how dedicated I am, by the way, so you can buy me a coffee to say thank you. I am going to link to the article in the description so you can go and read it for yourself if you haven't watched if you're subscribed to the New York Times, then no worries. If you aren't, if as long as you haven't read an article in the last month, I think you can access it for free. I think that's how it works. But if you have no interest of reading the full article or you've reached your free article quota for the day, then let me summarize it for you. In this, I have made a bullet point per paragraph. So here is my summary of his arguments. I was educated on the internet and learnt of T.S. Eliot from the 2001 film Apocalypse Now Redux. I found a copy of the collected works at the library and found the poems easy to memorise. I recited lines on the school bus. A key quote here that he says is, in those days, for some reason, I could not understand and would not wish to understand even now, lest the magic be dispelled. The poems seem to have an incantatory power. I thought there would be a bigger deal made of the centenary of the wasteland, but all I got was some book publications. There will be no poem out today that will likewise be celebrated, because Eliot killed poetry. Poetry isn't literally dead. There are buttloads of poets doing degrees and then teaching on those poetry degrees. Ouch. Poetry, however, is not well. It is on life support. I am not the first person to say that poetry is dead, and there have been lots of causes of death, including that its political correctness gone mad and we've stopped teaching the right poems. Another reason people think poetry died is because the modernist poets wrote poems that were too hard. These reasons might be true, but I think we stopped writing good poetry because modern life has disconnected us from nature Look at this quote from an 1823 poem about nature by Robert Southey. Southey? Southey. It's hard to follow, isn't it? That is because modern life means we don't get nature and we skim read. Poems aren't meant to accurately document nature, but nature is a basic element of poetry. Nature is used to express your experience in poems dating back to ancient times. Milton? the guy who wrote Paradise Lost, used the same images that were used in ancient Greece. Modern life with all its science and technology has ruined the re our relationship with the natural world. Instead of seeing nature as full as unseen forces, we see it as resources to be exploited or preserved. This is why we don't see nature imagery in today's poems. But, you cry, we can write poems about things other than nature, that don't allude to Greek and Latin classics, that don't use imagery that is centuries old. We can write poems about our feelings and use imagery of consumerism like plastic bottles and broken iPhone screens. Yes, we have been doing that, mostly because of T.S. Eliot. His work was seen as a disruption of the reverence to nature and poetic diction. That was the point. His deviations from traditional poetic forms reflected the content, the fragmentation of human experience. Eliot is the only poet in English poetry whose work can display the writer's personal anxieties and civilization's sense of horror. By combining the imageries of contemporary life with allusions to traditional literature, Eliot captured the loss of the pre-modern worldview. Eliot was so good that he changed poetry forever. Most poetry written in the last 50 years sounds like him. The problem is, Eliot took this way of writing to its conclusion and no one else could ever add to it ever. In writing about the end of the pre-modern era, Eliot is saying that he is the last poet. Can poetry be reincarnated? I think a socialist utopia is more likely than poetry being what I consider good again. In order for poetry to be alive again, 
we would need the muses back and the internet would need to die. So that's my summary. <laughs> It is interesting that we're getting an art form is dying because of the internet article from someone in their 30s, but here we go. Also, this does have a whole thing of like, poetry was better back in my day sort of vibe. Um, you know, it's linked to that whole music was better when I was young and my favourite season of SNL is the ones that were coming out when I was adolescent. It's a, it's a tough one, but... Uh, I think it's part of that. I think it's that sort of like nostalgia bait sort of thing. Here are the reasons why I think he's wrong. Number one, just because you don't like something doesn't mean it's dead. Number two, if your definition of what makes Elliot so great is that it is easy to memorize, I have some news. There are lots of poems less than a hundred years old that are also easy to memorize. I don't want to dispel the magic for you, but one of the qualities that make poems easy to remember and recite is the regular rhythm and or sound patterning techniques, such as rhyme, assonance, and alliteration. Our brains are really good at recognizing and remembering patterns, and that is why certain poems are easier to remember. Also, buttloads of poems in the last 100 years have used that technique and are easy to remember. One of the first poems I ever learnt by heart was called The Spot on My Bum by Jez Walsh. I still remember some lines to it. And I'm pretty sure that poem is younger than 100 years old. <laughs> you guys should read it, it's a really good poetry book. Reason number three that I think he's wrong. He thinks that modern life has disconnected us from nature. Okay, no, wait, I've got to take a minute. Side note. We need to talk about modern and his use of modern and my use of modern in this video. There are two contexts for the word modern. One, you have the like pre-modern life that he talks about. Um, and like, and he uses the word modern to refer to the modernist movement and then we have modern life which is like today life so let me explain this is not a perfect definition but we're just gonna go with it okay we're just gonna roll with like go with me here Modernism, usually used with a capital M, refers to a philosophical or art movement that began in the middle of the 19th century, 1800s, and finished about halfway through the 20th century, the 1900s. So it spans, give or take, 100 years before the Second World War. Um, and it can be seen as... Um, a reflection of the development of industry. So the industrial revolution and uh, modern life being, you know, planes, trains, automobiles, all of that stuff. Um, so that's the modern period. If you hear postmodern, that's sort of like Second World War onwards. Um, and that's when things get really unhinged. <laughs> But in this context, he also talks about modern life, which mean, just means by today, contemporary to today life, with the internet and social media and all of this. Reason number three, he thinks that modern, sm small m, today's life, has disconnected us from nature, and that is why poetry is bad now. I think he wants us all to return to romantic, capital R, romanticism, uh, art movement that happened at the beginning of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 1800s. Uh, famous romantic poets include Keats, Coleridge, Wordsworth, Blake. He wants us ret to return to the romantic period and stay there. Whilst I agree that there are many things wrong with modern life, including making it more difficult for urban communities to connect with nature. I do think this possibly has an impact on the mental health crisis, not so much the quality of poetry. Poetry is different from a hundred years ago because life is different from a hundred years ago. It is not worse. 
especially for women and marginalised communities. Number four, the reason why I think he's wrong. He says that one of the things that ruined our relationship with nature is that we know too much about it. That poetry has lost its reverence to nature as something unknowable. I'm not gonna lie, this does come across as a little bit anti-science here, my man. And fundamentally, I just disagree. I think the more science learns about the world and the larger universe, the more fascinating and inspiring it becomes. But I, that's just my opinion, and I think that might come down to our difference in philosophies. The fifth reason why I think he's wrong, and I'm gonna use a direct quote for what he says here. He says, with his most cinematic montages, Eliot creates a body of work that is unique in English poetry for its simultaneous ability to lay bare both the personal anxieties of its author and the sense of mechanised horror that has overtaken an entire civilization. This is just blatantly untrue. This is what good poetry does. It unites the personal experience with that of wider society. This is a quality not unique to Eliot, for God's sake. And I will be recommending some reading in a bit for you. Reason number six why I think he's wrong. Matthew argues that Eliot didn't just change poetry forever. He killed it. Nothing worthy could ever be added to the pantheon of poetry ever again. Whilst I do think that Eliot's work is part of a significant change in English poetry, I think it is more a reflection of the changes going on in society around him, just as the entirety of the modernist philosophy and art movement is. I think society has changed a lot over the last few centuries, and poetry has grown and changed as a result of it. But I do not think that poetry is worse as a result, just different. Okay. The seventh reason why I think he's wrong. He argues that the only way for poetry to be reincarnated is for the internet to die. He believes that a socialist utopia, again, a girl can dream, is more likely. Whilst I do agree that in order for poetry to change, society would need a big old change, and maybe the internet dying would be a way for us to return to our pastoral poetic roots, for all its evils, the internet, like any technology, is just the reflections of the humans that use it. And it has been awesome in democratising poetry. There are tons of poems out there that we can just read or watch or listen to. And personally, I think that's a good thing. It is worth saying as well that like when, you know, my whole argument about like poetry being a reflection of the society that we live in and all of that. There are loads of different societies. There are loads of people who live in different cultures and lead different lives. There is so much out there. There, like, and those cultures have poems. There are as many potential poets as there are humans on earth, and there are as many different interpretations of what makes good poetry as that you know as humans being on earth. So, like, my point is that like if the own you can't, you cannot, like surely there is poetry out there that you like because there are 8 billion people in the world and there are so many different cultures and experiences and societies that shape the poetry in which that poetry exists. Surely there's got to be something that you like. Okay, so on to the recommended reading and seeing as I have given you seven reasons why I believe that Matthew is wrong, I am going to recommend seven books to you. Matthew, if you're watching this, I genuinely recommend reading these. I think that they are excellent poets and poetry and I think that if you agree, whether you agree with Matthew or not, you will enjoy these poems. And Matthew, I think you should give these a go before you go spouting off with such silly articles again. The first one I recommend is Amanda Gorman, specifically for a poem whose centenary would be celebrated. I believe that Gorman's poem for Biden's inauguration, called The Hill We Climb, would definitely be a poem that's celebrated in the century. 
I've also heard good things about her collection, Call Us What We Carry as well. And she's Catholic. So Matthew, if you like Catholic poets, you might like Amanda Gorman, my dude. Also, do me a favour. This video came out in 2023. If you're watching this in any multiple of 10 years time, or even in a century's time, please comment down below to let me know if Amanda Gorman's poem is still sort of talked about and recognised as much as it was when it was first written. Admittedly, I doubt I will be around in 2123, but do comment anyway, let's keep the discussion going. Recommendation number two is more UK based and for this I recommend This Is The Place by Tony Walsh for a poem that would be remembered in a hundred years time. It's his poem that he wrote about the Manchester bombings and it was in the news loads and it is just a stunning poem. I also totally recommend checking out Tony Walsh's other work as well. He's a performance poet from Manchester in the UK and you might like him. Number three, my third recommendation is Seamus Heath. Me. This is especially because he combines nature imagery with the personal and the society-wide concerns. I think for me Seamus Heaney holds the place that Eliot holds for Matthew. I discovered Seamus Heaney in school. We studied him for my GCSEs and I fell in love with his writing. Yes, I must be one of the only people to go to school in the UK in this century who likes poetry and actually enjoyed studying poetry for GCSEs. I've always been an English nerd, but his poem Midterm Break is stunning and the line, a four foot box, a foot for every year, lives rent free in my mind. Mwah. Read some Shane and his TV. My fourth recommendation is Plath. Just read Sylvia Plath, for God's sake. Like, just read her. I, I've got nothing more to say, just read Sylvia Plath. My fifth recommendation is Denez Smith, especially for poems that capture the personal and lay it next to society-wide concerns. Just incredible, just joyous. Watch, the video, watch any videos of them or buy their book go for it. My sixth recommendation is Joelle Taylor. She actually won the T.S. Eliot Prize for her collection Canto. It is a cracking collection about a disappearing culture. I actually reviewed it so you can watch the book review for that here. If you're the homophobic flavour of Catholic then you should absolutely read Joelle and Denez Smith. In fact those are not no longer recommended reading, they are required reading read Joelle Taylor and Denez Smith. And my last recommendation is me. <laughs> my debut poetry collection is out in March and it is available to pre-order now. The collection is about my dad dying and how you grieve for someone when they are an asshole. I actually use quite a lot of nature imagery, including two poems about the same place, which show how the speaker, it's me, hi, I'm the speaker, it's me. <laughs> God, oh, I hate myself. Okay, how the speaker reacts to a natural space before and after experiencing bereavement. You might actually like it, Matthew. Although I would say, maybe skip the poem, one day I woke up and I realised that God is dead. Or don't, and we can discuss your views on my loss of faith. So this is by no means an exhaustive list of poets to read from the last 100 years. These were just the first ones that popped into my head while I was reading the article. Please comment down below with any other reading recommendations that you have and I will add them to the reading list in the description. We'll make it like a live living document, shall we? So, in conclusion, poetry is not dead. It's just a thing article writers say when they want the rage clicks. Poetry is not dead just because you don't like anything written in the last hundred years. If you don't like any poetry written in the last hundred years, it's probably because you haven't read widely enough. Poetry, like any art form, can be seen as a reflection of the societal and historical context in which it is created. If that context changes, so the creations change too. It is not better or worse, just different. So, 
that's it for this week's video. If you like this video, please do like it, share it and subscribe for more. If you really liked it, you can support the channel with your money by buying me a coffee or joining me on Patreon. If you didn't like the video, please comment down below telling me exactly why and share it with your friends so they can get angry and comment why they disagree with me too. You see how rage clips work? Don't forget, online and in-person tickets to my book launch party are on sale now and you can buy them and pre-order a copy of my book through the links in my description. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you all next week. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.